Welcome to Face to Face. And today we're going to talk about nuclear, we're going to talk about energy, we're going to talk about renewable energy. And I'm with uh, Professor Carl Grossman. Thank you very much for being on the show. It's really an honor to have you. Just to give you a brief introduction, Presence has been founded on peace and on violence and are working for over 13 years on the issue and are part of Abolition 2000. And I can, so you're at home. Thank you very much, Professor. A pleasure to be with you, David. So just briefly uh, introduce your long, long, long experience on uh, fighting the, the good war against nuclear weapons and nuclear energy, and then uh, try to uh, communicate this to the new generation as being a professor. So um, go ahead, welcome. Well, my specialty is investigative reporting, and I've been doing that ever since, uh, well, we're talking over 50 years, it's been my specialty. <laughs> And um, I, I not only practice investigative reporting, but I teach a course in investigative reporting at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. And a special focus of mine, I've done all kinds of investigative reporting through the years, but a special focus of mine, environmental issues. And yeah. there's so many uh, horror stories I know. involving uh, well, the air we breathe and uh, the, oh, now we eat, <laughs> the food we eat, the, food that we eat. the radioactivity that is being uh, emitted uh, into our atmosphere. I mean, uh, and the problem here with many of these environmental issues is that people just do not know. Uh, and uh, they kind of trust that, well, like with climate change. And it's a climate crisis, not just a change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that those in charge are going to deal with uh, what's obvious. I mean, just look at look at the weather uh, here in in New York, uh, where I'm speaking from, and we've had a fall, which is like a well, they used to call it Indian summer. Uh -huh. uh, but I mean, 65 degrees, 70 degree days, uh, extreme weather events. I mean, I, I'm on Long Island, which is east of New York City, and there were there were tornadoes, like a dozen oh. tornadoes, just last week. Well, Never, California was also well served, huh? and Texas. I well, mean, in Texas, yeah, but in, uh, in the Midwest, but it turns yeah. out that suddenly Long Island, for the first time, maybe in a century, Long Island was a damage was done because of the the water surrounding Long Island being very warm, very hot because of global warming. And that feeds hurricanes. It feeds uh, tornadoes. Uh, and, you know, it, it's so visible, the crisis that we're in, in terms of climate change. So, uh, so I don't want to cut you, but I just want to say, we're just finishing COP26. What is your take on, on, on how does this COP26 hand, and how do you see it? And briefly, I mean, it's, it's just to to get your, your, your take on it. Well, I, I agree totally with Greta Thunberg. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> uh, the brilliant, articulate young yeah. woman who... She's great, right, she's right. Uh, ...who described uh, this recent uh, conference, uh, sadly, as a, a PR exercise, a public exactly. relations exercise, to give the illusion that things are being done. But uh, I, I, I mean, it turned out that China is going to continue with coal plants. And yeah, it's, uh, I mean, too. It, it's, it's, and the US is, it's better now than for sure with Biden than it was with Trump, who denied global warming, who, who denied climate change. Uh, but the US is not doing what it should be doing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and here we are. The, the heat is on. The world is getting hotter and hotter. Uh, if if we don't if we don't deal with this and quick, we're beyond the point of no return. And, and the request for energy it's increasing by the minute. I mean, it, it's we want car, electrical car. We want uh, uh, in in Europe. Uh, it's the price are doubling of energy. So people, are, I'm not sure they're going to be able to pay the bills. Uh, the, and it's it's quite complicated, and the investment will need to be done to 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 reroute the direction uh, is not made. I mean, we still have a, a very few investment on on renewable energy. Well, 
what I have found specializing in doing investigative reporting on environmental and energy issues for many decades is that virtually all polluting processes and polluting products have clean, green, renewable, sustainable alternatives that we don't have to have coal power. We don't have to have power through the other fossil fuels, uh, oil and gas uh, to allow fracking, to, uh, to just, just, just rape the countryside. Uh, we don't need to have nuclear power. We can, we can have safe, clean, green processes. And in fact, an excellent new book by a, a wonderful scientist. Mm -hmm. I, I suggest uh, viewers get a copy of this, Mark Jacobson. Uh, he, he's a professor too at Stanford University in California. And he's written a book 100%, just out, 100%, not 60% or 70%, 100% clean, renewable energy and storage and storage for everything. And here in a book, hundreds of pages is, is a blueprint for a... You know, but, but the question is not the solution. The problem, Costa Rica did it. Costa Rica is on 250% of renewable energy and you can, you can charge your car for free in Costa Rica. The solution is it, there. The problem is the... the Political motivation and the business motivation is not there, and, and and the investment are not made. So I mean, that's think that's where we are, no? Yeah, well, it's it's uh, these people who are behind the uh, the poisoning of our planet, the poisoning of life on it. Uh, they have such a hold, such a hold on on governments. I mean, speaking about uh, the U.S. government the lobbying done by the speaking now of energy of the the coal and the oil and the uh, uh, the gas uh, so-called natural gas industries and the the nuclear power industry is just uh, just immense uh, immense I mean you, you look at this Joe Manchin from West Virginia who's trying to stop everything can, can stop in terms of our government uh, current government doing something about climate change his involvement in the coal industry, uh, not only getting money from the coal industry, but his son is an executive of a big coal company and he gets money from that company. It's, it's, it's just enormous. I mean, the government in the United States still remains in the hands of the people who are doing this damage and, and, and just do not want to stop. And what they'd like to do is to... Uh, confuse everybody and to lie and to claim that it's all fine. Fracking is fine and there's no problem with coal and uh, we, we must drill, baby drill for oil and we must build new and improved nuclear power plants, no such thing. Uh, and they have the ear uh, by putting money into the pockets of those who are we making or making decisions in government. And then furthermore, in government itself, uh, there are these bureaucracies that are, for example, in the United States, there's the Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission, the NRC, which is supposed to somehow regulate atomic energy, nuclear power. But uh, uh, the NRC should stand for not Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but no real concerns. I mean, it just rubber stamps applications for nuclear power, promotes nuclear power in every way. It's involved now in extending the licenses of existing nuclear power plants in the U.S., and there's a lot less than 100 at this point, to 100 years, 100 years. Oh. I mean, the plants were built for at the most 40 years because after 40 years, the, the radiation were just in brittle, the metals inside these machines and but uh, what the NRC has done, the Nuclear so, Rubber Stamp Commission, is to allow these plants to operate first. It was 60, and then it was 80, and now the plan is 100. Oh, I, I, I mean, imagine, and, and also to operate the plants. Operate means to let them run hotter and it, it's, it's it, it, more intensely. It, it's like, imagine being on a car 100 years old 
and being on an interstate of the United States, racing down the highway in this 100-year-old car, a, a car from not 2021, but 1921 at, at 100 miles an hour. I mean, disaster is being asked for, and it has occurred with nuclear, most recently Fukushima. Uh, before that, it was the, uh, the, the horrible uh, uh, disaster at Chernobyl. Before that, it was... Um, the Three Mile Island accident in the United States. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the reasons I got into nuclear power as, as a major area of investigating was the claim uh, that uh, uh, you're not going to have actually on television. I was working for a, a channel here on Long Island, WLIW, and the folks asked me to do a piece. This is in the early 70s about. Uh, about nuclear power, and I went to Brookhaven National Laboratory. It's on Long Island, and it was set up in 1947, largely to develop civilian uses of nuclear technology, to, to zap food with, the, with radiation so you could eat a strawberry if you wanted to 20 years later, uh, to develop nuclear-powered airplanes and nuclear-powered cars even, would you believe, uh, to uh, use nuclear power, the heat of, of, of fission to boil water, to, uh, uh, to turn a turbine, to generate electricity. Uh, so I went there to Brookhaven Lab to get the so-called other side of the story. And the, uh, the scientists there looked, looked straight at me and my camera and they said, maybe every couple of hundred years, they might be a minor accident. But these nuclear power plants are built with such redundancy that, you know, it would be a minor accident. Uh, I started writing my first book on nuclear power. Good. It is cover up yeah. what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power. The day I learned about the Three Mile Island accident in 1979, I sat down and uh, went through it. It took oh. me almost a year uh, putting down the in a book the facts, the truth, a lot with facsimiles of documents about nuclear power. Uh, it's it's uh, so. So the president of France, Macron, say about uh, uh, nuclear fusion. Then it's going to be the future, and then France is going to invest. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Well, the way I handle nuclear fusion, Chris, exactly. Macron's uh, claim. I mean, the, the, the poor guy doesn't know. <laughs> no, no, but fusion, page, I want you to. <laughs> 251 and 252. I mean, uh, let, let me read what, what I write in the book. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, again, this is, a, this is years ago. What about fusion? This has been held out by the nuclear establishment as a somewhat cleaner form of nuclear power as the hydrogen bomb, a fusion device, is somewhat cleaner in fallout than an atomic bomb. Somewhat, uh, and I talk about how fusion works, uh, how it blow, it blasts the nuclei apart. Uh, but to start the process, extremely high temperatures are required, a hundred million degrees centigrade, uh, more than six times the estimated temperature of the sun's interior. Dwight Eisenhower, when he was president, suggested that the Atomic Energy Commission. This is the predecessor agency of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S. Keep the public, this is a quote from Eisenhower, confused about fission and fusion. Fusion, in fact, is a dirty radioactive process like fission. And they go on explaining, uh, as in fact, somebody should explain to, uh, to Macron about how fusion is not the answer. The answer is clean, yeah. renewable energy with storage. Right, but but okay. So renewable energy. We have right now from the, we have twenty percent of the U.S. production of renewable energy. Eighty percent is produced by non 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 renewable. How 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 are we going to fill out the gap and 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 the and the, the, the request is going to go increasing by the cars and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I'm out of work to see how can we, we're going to match it. Well, the, the, the fastest growing sector 
in energy now is, is safe, clean, renewable energy. And I'm speaking here of uh, solar. I mean, I'm talking to people watching from a little house, a salt box house in Sag Harbor, New York. And on my roof is 38 solar photovoltaic panels. And they send the electricity that's generated to a, uh, a little box the utility provides you for, which tells you uh, uh, how much electricity you're using. And uh, my box right here, even, even on a cloudy day, uh, even on a cool uh, winterish day, the, the meter on that, that little box from public service electric gas is running backwards. In other words, I'm sending more electricity into the grid than my little house uses yeah. uh, on my roof too, or uh, two thermal panels, which, which heat up. It's like uh, leaving your car with the windows up, even on a, a moderately warm, even not even that much of a warm day. The sun does a job in terms of heating the interior of your car. And the same with those thermal panels, which have water in them. And it sends this hot water into my house. You take a shower in the morning and it's uh, the water has been stored, the hot water. You take a shower with hot water heated by the sun. I mean, this is just a, a small example of what the whole world oh, can do. We absolutely. Can... The, the story, it's, for me, it's how the U.S. is not investing on that story. And, and, and so I, I, I don't know how can we match it. Okay, we, we have a few minutes left. So do you want to talk about something specific on the book? Uh, well, you, 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 you mean Professor Jacobson's book? Your book. <laughs> My book. Oh, well, cover up what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Professor Jacobson wrote the 100% clean renewable energy yeah. store as, and so forth. But My first up. My first book on nuclear power is called Cover Up, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. And as I mentioned, what I, what I did for the book was there's so much baloney that the people involving, involved in nuclear power would throw at us. I mean, like right now, the claim is that nuclear power would be good to deal with climate change. Uh, it's it's carbon free. It's a, it's a renewable, it's a green energy source. Not so. In fact, the nuclear fuel cycle, mining, milling, enrichment is carbon intensive. And in fact, nuclear plants themselves emit carbon, carbon-14, radioactive carbon. Uh, years ago, they used to talk about nuclear power. This was the baloney from decades ago. Uh, it would be too cheap to meter, we were told in the United States years ago about nuclear power. I mean, it, it's the most expensive energy form. And there's one nuclear power plant. There's two of them actually being built in the U.S. South. The cost of construction right now is $13 billion for each of these wow. nuclear plants. Wow. And in terms of accidents, again, those folks at Brookhaven Lab, those nuclear scientists, uh, they said, well, every couple of years you might have a, a small accident. Well, in a report that was done, and I, I print portions of it in cover-up, uh, they talk about uh, the consequences of a nuclear plant accident. This was done in the 1960s. And uh, again, it's right here are the words, right from the report. This is before desktop publishing. I took a scissor, cut out the lines from the report, and it pasted it down on the, the flats for the book. The possible the size of the area of such a disaster, and this is the scientists at Brookhaven National Laboratory, the possible size of the area of such a disaster, they write, might be equal to that of the state of Pennsylvania. I mean, wow. and this was a decade before the Three Mile Island accident happened in 1979. Wow. And it's done at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, I've written other books involving nuclear technology. Uh, one uh, is titled The Wrong Stuff, and it has to do with the use of nuclear power in space. Back in the 1985, I was reading a government document, an investigative reporting. You like to do a lot of 
reading of government and corporate documents. It becomes a paper chase, but there's all kind of interesting facts and uh, information in those documents. And told in 1985 about how NASA was to launch two space uh, shuttles uh, in 1986, one being the Challenger with plutonium fuel space probes on them. And my book cover up had come out in, uh, uh, in 1980. And so I knew about nuclear technology writing that book. And I knew that plutonium, it's agreed is the most toxic yeah. of all radioactive material, one millionth of a gram if inhaled in, in one's lung cause lung cancer. And here the challenger was to have pounds of it on board. Uh, I, I used the U.S. Freedom of Information Act to ask the government what, what the consequences would be if, if, if the challenger uh, blew up on launch and the, the second shuttle was to be that was to be launched in 86 uh, with a plutonium fuel space probe on it. Uh, what would be the consequences if it blew up on launch and one in a hundred rockets, chemical rockets, undergo major malfunctions on launch, largely by blowing up, or there was an accident in the lower atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, it didn't achieve orbit, came crashing down to earth. For months, there was this cover up by NASA and the Department of Energy, US Department of Energy, involved in providing the energy source, these radioisotope thermoelectric generators fueled with plutonium. Uh, finally, they sent me documents. It took, it took almost a year. And the claim was uh, that um, this didn't present a danger because the likelihood of a catastrophic shuttle accident was one in a hundred thousand, one in a hundred thousand. Then came in 1986, in fact, I was on my way in the car to teach my investigative reporting class at SUNY Old Westbury, came the news that the Challenger blew up. All I was thinking about is, wow, if it would be the next mission in May of 86, with all that plutonium aboard. We will be, we will well, be fry. You wouldn't want to go visit <laughs> Disney uh, uh, Anytime soon. World, and, and for, a few, for a few hundred years. I went to, uh, it was pay phones then before cell phones. I called the Nation magazine. I said, you folks know that the next mission of Challenger was to be a nuclear mission. They didn't. I wrote an editorial of the lethal shuttle. Uh, I began writing this book, The Wrong Stuff. Uh, incidentally, quickly, NASA changed the odds of a of, of a shuttle accident from one in 100,000 to one in 76. That's the title of one of the chapters in the book. And I began investigating. And there's been accidents in the use of nuclear in space. The worst, 64, a satellite with plutonium on it, snapped 9A, came crashing down, uh, breaking apart in the atmosphere, spreading plutonium all over the planet. Dr. John Goffman, involved in the early experiments with plutonium, an MD, a PhD. You're so former associate director at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, a professor, University of California at Berkeley. He long connected the SNAP 9A accident, the use of nuclear in space by NASA uh, as causing uh, a spike in lung cancer because of the dispersal of plutonium on Earth. Begin focusing in on the why, like oh, in all the president's men deep throat tells Bob Woodward, follow the money. Who's making money with the use of nuclear in space? Turns out that General Electric was manufacturing these radioisotope thermoelectric generators and stood to make a lot of bucks by their use in space. Uh, these national nuclear laboratories, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Brookhaven Lab, deeply involved, looking for grant money funding to use nuclear in space. As, as I mentioned before, Brookhaven Lab way back was interested in nuclear powered rockets, which in fact, right now, NASA is, uh, is they claim they'll get astronauts to Mars quicker, nuclear powered rockets. But what if there's an explosion on launch? What if, if they come hurtling back at the earth and, and break up? And then thirdly, what I found out, and this led to another book called Weapons in Space, the military was very interested in nuclear in space because oh, the, the whole nature in the 1980s of the Star Wars program 
of Ronald Reagan, the so-called Strategic Defense Initiative, uh -huh. was to have orbiting battle platforms with laser weapons, hypervelocity guns, and particle beam weapons on them, energized by reactors and super plutonium systems overhead on these battle platforms. In fact, James Abramson, who was the director of the Strategic Defense Initiative, he gave a speech I quoted in The Wrong Stuff, saying that without reactors in orbit, there's going to have to be a long light cord, extension cord that goes down to the earth, bringing up power for these, these high-powered weapons. And so ever since then, I've been very, um, very much involved with the, uh, with the use of nuclear power in space and the weaponization of space. Uh, I uh, helped found the Global Network against weapons and nuclear power in space. I uh, written numerous, just Google my name and nukes, yeah, yeah. nuclear power in space, we numerous know. articles. That's and right. right now the US is moving ahead with a broadened use of nuclear power in space, even though, well, I, I, I mentioned uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, just a few years ago, NASA launched the Juno space probe way out to Jupiter with solo photaic panels, like on my roof, providing the energy instead of plutonium. As I say, virtually every polluting process and product has a clean, safe, green alternative. Uh, nevertheless, the U.S., uh, that we've just created the U.S. Space Force, which uh, Trump said uh, its mission was to have the U.S. dominate Space. This is despite the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which sets space aside for peaceful purposes. But the U.S. is, uh, uh, is breaking this. Uh, uh, Biden has not reversed Trump's I know. decision to create this uh, new sixth branch of U.S. armed forces to have this one country, the United States, somehow dominate space. I mean, this is going to cause China. And Russia, and then no, other of course, countries, of course, to respond in kind, and the heavens are going to be turned into a war zone. And so, this is something I'm deeply involved in. And I would suggest, well, I got a chance that folks connect with the global network against weapons and nuclear power in space. Uh, the website is um, uh, www space for the numeral four peace.org and get involved in their activities and their informational campaigns so people know what what's up here, what's happening here. Professor, thank you so much. It's a ton of information and uh, really we, um, we appreciate your contribution today. Uh, this interview, please uh, um, come back anytime you have any news. This is your... Uh, your press agency and uh, thank you for uh, watching the show that was face to face and please keep watching your news on presenza.com thank you so much thank you david